explain you some ideas about uh, two notions that come together very naturally, I think, in uh, algebraic topology and come also very naturally in a different way in uh, discrete mathematics and set theory. And uh, so this is joint work with Eric Colin Verdier and Grégory Gino, uh, who are both working in Paris. Um, and just before I start, I'd like just to make a disclaimer. I will try to remain non-technical. And that will be easy because I think I will not be capable of becoming technical. So there are a number of proofs of statement that I will simply state. I will not give proofs. Okay. Uh, if you are interested in, in technical details, we can talk after the, uh, after the presentation, if you want. And other than that, don't, mostly don't hesitate to ask questions uh, if anything is not clear or if you want uh, more details. So, uh, what is a Helly number? So the idea is you have a collection of, we start with a collection of sets. And we are interested in the properties of intersections of these sets. And one way to describe these properties is to look at the largest set that we can find, la largest family that we can find, that has empty intersection, but for which all proper subfamilies have non-empty intersection. Okay? So, and the size of such a set, of such a family, is what we call the Helly number of the collection. So, number of C is on the size of the largest So, for example, if my sets are uh, these three sets, that, that is a minimal, uh, an inclusion-wise minimal family with empty intersection. Okay? The intersection of the three sets is empty, and any two have a point in common. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, oh, just... Uh, I will talk about some topological spaces, so it doesn't hurt to think of all sets as being open. Okay, just in case anything bothers you, think of the set as being open. Uh, I know why is that called the Helly number? It can be traced to Helly theorem in convex geometry, which simply says that if C is a collection of convex sets in D dimensions in RD, then its any number is at most D plus one. Okay. So it's a uniform bound that is completely independent of C on the size of C. Uh, it's, uh, it only depends on the dimension of the space. And let me assume that it is finite. And this bound is tight. You can find d plus one sets that have an empty intersection where every d intersects. Uh, now, an, an interesting uh, yeah. so an interesting extension of this is uh, for a union of convex sets. So Nina Amenta I believe, showed the following. If C is uh, 
So if we take a collection of sets in D dimension, still RD, and now we don't assume that they are convex, but we assume that they, are, they have convex component. So they may not be connected, but each connected component should be convex. And they should have some um, bounded intersection property in the sense that the, whenever you take a subfamily, the number of connected components of the intersection of that subfamily should be bounded uniformly. Under these two conditions, she, be, she gave a bound on the Helly number of the family. Okay, so. Such that for any f in C, intersection of f has at most r. And the bound she gave is actually the constant that bounds the number of connected components times the Halley number for the case where you have convex sets. Okay, so for R equal one, we get Halley theorem. And as R increase, increases, the bound increases linearly. Okay? So this bound can actually be seen to be tight. Um, let me give an example for d equal 1, that should be easy, and r equal 2. So it's actually, I uh, realized yesterday uh, that this example is part of the Korean flag. <laughs> <laughs> In a sense. So what I mean is, so not going into details, in the Korean flag you have four sets, right, here. So in here I think is this. So, so too long and too short. So let me take <laughs> two copies of this one. And I don't know if I have some colors. No, okay, maybe not. So let me number them. Let me call this one and one, uh, two and two, three and three, and four and four. And let me project everything on this line. So now I get a collection of families of union of intervals. So the first set is a projection of one, the second set is a projection of two, and so on. And now every three have a point in common. All four don't. Okay, so this shows that you, you cannot do better than four. You cannot prove that the bond is lower. <coughs> no, an interesting question is what is really essential to prove upper bound on the, these Halley numbers? What kind of properties are we really using? So apparently, these two theorems tell us convexity makes it easy. Convexity allows this kind of theorem to happen. And somehow, the topological complexity in the sense the number of connected components also appears. And so what I would like to, to describe is a result where we give a bound on Halley numbers depending on exactly those two conditions. Some topological assumption that replaces complex convexity and some measure of the topological complexity of the intersections. So the first step in relaxing those assumptions was actually made by Haley uh, a bit later. Also this one. So uh, it's called Haley's topological theorem. So what Ellie observed is that you don't really need the sets to be convex, you only need them to intersect like convex sets. In the sense that every intersection should have the same 
topology homotopy as a convex set. A simple idea is assume every intersection is contractible. Okay, so in a, in a sense, what he said is that the Halley number So where a good cover is simply, so what you say is that the bond on the Halley number that is valid for convex set extends to good cover, and the good cover is simply a collection of sets with the property that every subfamily intersects in something that is either empty or contractible. Okay, contractible homotopic to a point. So, so we are So in fact, he proves something a bit more general uh, that only assumes that intersection of subfamilies up to size d have trivial homology, a homology ball, which is weaker than being contractible, and that the intersection at rank, uh, I mean, yeah, he only assumes that. But let me stick with this simple statement. And similarly to Amenta, uh, to Amenta theorem, there is a generalization of this, ver of this theorem that allows to have several connected components. It was proven by Kalai and Meshulam. In 2007. And what they say is, if you have uh, if so G, if G is a good cover in RD if C is a collection of sets such that every for for every f in C, the intersection of that subfamily is a disjoint union of at most R elements from G. Then the Halley number is at most r times d plus 1. OK. Is it still readable? More or less. So instead of assuming, so this has the same structure. You have a collection of sets. You assume that every intersection can be decomposed as a disjoint union of sets from a family that is nice with respect to intersections, namely a good cover. Interestingly, the bond here is the same. Okay, so this is really a generalization, topological generalization. No, why am why am I not happy with that? I said I wanted to have something that was uh, simply real, assuming some topological some topological structure on the connected components and some complexity on the number of connected components. Well. So if I take two sets, one which is like this and the other one which is like that, then the intersection are uh, contractible and you have two contractible components. Yeah, you have two components, but you cannot use this theorem with R equal to because two connected components from two different sets intersect in something that is not contractible. 
So the ground set, the, the set of components that we use to represent the, the object, is not a good cover. Okay. So why can't I live with that? Um, because, so as Otrid said, we, we have been working for quite some time on heli numbers. So we have been looking at certain heli numbers in a very particular context, namely line geometry. So the typical theorem in uh, what's a field called geometric transversal theory is the following. You have uh, a family F of such in Rd. So you call F the element of F, for example, A1, AM. And you assume, you make some assumption on the geometry of the AI. Okay? In our case, we have been looking at the, uh, the situation where the AI are both of the equal radius on this joint. This joint. And now you look at the second collection of sets, which is the following. You, you let Ti be the set of lines intersecting AI. And go, the, the results are heli numbers on the T high. Okay. And for example, if you have these joint unit balls in D dimension, you can bound this heli number by 4D minus 1. And this is very particular. If you allow the ball to intersect, if you have different radii, the bond collapses. It's no longer valid. If you look at ellipsoids, it's no longer valid. If you look at distant translate of a convex polyhedron, then Andreas has, has a result from 2004 or 2003 that shows that the number cannot be bonded either. And so there have been a, quite some work trying to understand the, to de delineate the domain where you can bound these kind of numbers on the situation where you can't bound them. Okay, and so when we, when I work with Otfried, I often come with a, you know, um, a wishing list for the uh, Santa Claus. So this is. So a list of properties that I would like to have, a list of, of statements that I hope can be proven. And in that case, there are several theorems in geometric transversal theory, several situations where bonds on the Rayleigh numbers can be proven, and which I believed could be reduced, deduced from a statement like that. That we could maybe prove some topological and combinatorial properties of the sets of lines, and we could plug that in such a theorem and get automatically a bond on the heli number instead of spending 20 pages looking at particular inequalities between lengths, angles, and thing, and conclude that the heli number is bonded. Okay? So is there some kind of generalization? And this is not it. Why? Because if you take a situation like this, Then you can find. Okay, let's assume it's a line. Okay, by making those two disks sufficiently close, I can make. Let's assume also this is a line. I can make the tangents that go up and the tangents that go down arbitrarily close. That is, make the angles they make arbitrarily small so that they can intersect those two disks. I know if I number this one, this two, this three, this four. It turns out that the following property is true. If you pick two lines that, be, that intersect a collection of disjoint unit balls, then if they intersect the balls in the same order, you can always move one to the other. 
two lines that intersect a family of disjoint balls in a given order belong to the same connected component of Ti, of the intersection of the Ti. And moreover, this set of intersection is contractible. I mean, this set of transversal in a given order is contractible. So, but the problem is, if you take T1 to T3, so there you get, we can prove you get one contractible component. If you take T2 to T4, same thing. But now if, if you intersect those two sets, you will get two different components for this. Okay? And so you, you are precisely in this situation where each set is obtained with a single component and they intersect in at most two components, but those components do not form a good cover. Okay? So wanting to reduce several theorems from geometric transversal theory to the same topological theorem uh, of this type, we need to get rid of this good cover assumption. Okay? And so this is what we try. So why should it be true? Well, because someone proved it. <coughs> Before us. <laughs> Namely, Jerry uh, uh, Matuchek. proved that the following is true. So you take a set C and you assume that for any subset the intersection has at most a certain number of connected components each Contractible. Using only those two assumptions, he proved that the number, the Halley number of f, is bounded by some function of d and r. Okay, so you don't, if you just want to have a bounded Halley number, you don't have to, that the connected components of your set on all their intersections, the connected component of all the intersections form a good cover. It is not necessary. Just having a hypo assumption on the number of connected components and some understanding of their topology, namely that they are contractible, is enough to ensure that the Halley number remains bounded, independently of C. Okay? So in fact he proves something much, uh, a bit stronger because he doesn't really need contractible, he just need that you don't have fine cycle of a big of a large size, but uh, uh, let me stick again with contractible. And so our result is we prove that this bound can be taken as being the same as the other one. So, so this theorem was proven by constructing a certain complex and showing that this complex cannot be embedded in a certain space and uh, getting an intersection between faces and from this intersection getting a contradiction on a certain lower bound on the Halley number. And the process gives a bound that is really, really huge. I mean, it's not even explicitly given. But when you look at the paper, it, it doesn't seem reasonable that this bound could be, could be nice. So, so it's actually, so it, we're not really just sharpening a bound, we're really giving, given, giving an explicit bound where none was really obtainable. And uh, the second interesting thing is that what we are doing is simply we take the proof of this result and we extend it. There are three ingredients, and we just need to extend the three ingredients, and everything works out quite fine. So let me...
quickly outline. So, so far so good, no question, no doubt, uncertainty, hesitation. Can you give some one example which uh, your this Matosex theorem applies but the old theorem doesn't apply? This one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Okay, let me maybe uh, unfold it in a bit more detail. In a little, uh, if you take a1 a n uh, to be this joint unit balls in RD, uh, you let Ti be the lines intersecting AI and it takes C as a collection T1 Tn. Uh, so perhaps simple point uh, Ti doesn't live in RD. Okay, T line doesn't live in RD plus one actually. T li lives in a space which is a Grassmannian and which is uh, not really, so it's 2D two two minus 2 dimensional, but you cannot parameterize it by a linear space or even a projective space of dimension 2D minus 2. But you can almost do it simply by taking two parallel planes and putting, uh, hyperplanes, sorry, uh, and picking some frame here you translate that frame to get a frame of the other hyperplane and every line that is not parallel to the hyperplanes will intersect them in one point each that gives you d minus one coordinates and d minus one coordinates and that altogether you get two d minus two coordinates which uniquely define your line okay so uh, it turns out that it's not really a big deal if you want to bond the Halley number of these of the Ti to work in that space, so in R to the 2d minus 2. If you just want to get a constant bond, okay, because you are basically removing a sub linear subspace, I mean the trace of the Grassmannian by a linear subspace from your set, and you can prove that when you do so, you actually cut each set in at most two pieces. And so you're basically blowing up R by a factor of two. It doesn't really matter. And we could prove two facts. First fact is that each connected component of an intersection of F for F in C is contractible. So this is not obvious. It's not trivial, but it's true. Okay. And a second thing is that there is a one to one correspondence between C C If you take a line that intersects a sequence of balls and you move it continuously and you keep it intersecting every ball in your sequence, then the order in which the line intersects the balls will not change. So you can think of the line as being an oriented line. Okay? And it turns out that this is actually a characterization of the connected component. Not only does this order remain the same on each connected component, it has to be different on two connected components. Okay? And, and so what we could do is to, we could also bound the number of orders.
if you take any disjoint unit balls in any dimension, any arbitrary dimension, any fixed dimension, the maximum number of orders in which you can meet them, let me put a six here, is at most six. And uh, it's tempting to put three simply because if you can have a given order, you can have the reverse. So usually we work on the pairs of reverse orders. Okay, that is independently of the number of balls in your collection, independently of the dimension in which you are working. So with this, two, it seems like we could apply this because connected components are contractible. Uh, sorry, with this, with this, that, on that. The connected components are contractible, and the number of connected components it is bounded by some constant, namely six. The problem is simply that this can happen. So if you take the set of connected components of intersections of subfamilies, they do not form a good cover. And this is one example. Because T1, the intersection of T1 and T3 is one component, the intersection of T2 and T4 is one component, and the intersection of these two sets should be either empty or contractible for it to be a good cover, but it has two components, namely the component corresponding to the order 1, 2, 3, 4, and the, compo uh, the component corresponding to the order 2, 1, 3, 4. So we cannot apply this theorem, but we can apply my two check theorem. Okay? So the idea of the proof of Kalai and Meshulam uh, is to use three, uses three ingredients. First, it uses nerves. Then it uses Lorentz numbers. And finally, it uses a projection theorem. Given a collection, so if C is a collection of set, we define N of C to be the family of all subsets of C with non empty intersection. Okay, so this this is a, uh, um, this is contained in in the set of subsets. Okay, and it is stable by taking subset. If one, two, three have non-empty intersections, then obviously one, two must have non-empty intersection. Two, three must have non-empty intersection, and so on. And so this is what is called an abstract simplicial complex. Uh, so it has been studied since, uh, I think, at least the 1950s. Uh, and so in particular, if the sets are, are nice, the nerve of their nerve, as a nerve of a collection, describe essentially the union. So just think of, uh, take three segments and try to position them in a way where every pair intersect, but the three do not intersect end up with something like this. So let's look at the nerve of this. Then we get a vertex for one, because one is non-empty. Vertex for two, three. No, one and two intersect, two and three intersect, one and three intersect, and that's it. And if you look at the union, well, it's homotopy equivalent to this complex. OK, let's do it instead of segments, let's take ellipses. Well, same, right? If you want your ellipses to have the property that uh, the three don't intersect, but any pair intersects, the union will have to be homotopic to that. And this is actually the, what's called the nerve theorem. The 
and C is called the nerve? Right. Yes. Ah, yeah. Of C. For obvious reason, right? It's represent the nerve. Um, so I don't remember exactly, I think it was 1950, but uh, might be off by a, few, a couple of years. So it says that if C is a good cover, then the union of C is homotopic to the nerve of C. So it has more, it has more detailed statement, but let me stick with that one. So what does this mean? This means that on simplicial complexes, you can define homology, singular homology. You can define homotopy. You can also define homotopy or homology uh, from a, uh, sorry, you can define simplicial homology or homotopy on the simplicial complex. You can define the singular homology on the union, on the space, the geometric space, or the topological space, and the two coincide. They coincide in homology, they even coincide in homotopy. Okay? So, interestingly, uh, this my understanding, but I mean, from an outsider, it seems like this is a convenient. This was introduced as a way to talk about spaces, just by looking at some combinatorial structure. The interesting thing is that in the proof, in their proof, the proof of their theorem, Kelly and Meshulam will use it the other way around. They will use the property of the space to talk about the combinatorial structure. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a nerve on the nerve theorem. So the Lorentz number of a simplicial complex X it is okay. So you take a simplicial complex X and you look at all induced subcomplexes. So the induced subcomplex is simply you take the set of simplices of X that are contained in Y. So it gives you another simplicial complex, or again contained in 2 to the Y, uh, stable by subsets. And for each of these, you look at when is the ith homology group, when does the ith homology group vanish? Okay, and you look at the smallest g, j, that guarantees that all these groups vanish for all i larger than j, for all induced simplicial complexes of x. Okay, and you call this the Lorentz number of x. And now, the nice property that we have is that if you have, if c is a collection of sets, then the Heli number of C is at most the Lorentz number of the nerve of C plus 1. The Heli number is bounded by the Lorentz number of the nerve. Why is that? Simply because assume you can find a family of size k with empty intersection and where every subset has non-empty intersection. So you take the induced, so assume that what, okay, let me may perhaps do it completely. So let y be x in c. So 
I take a minimal, inclusion-wise minimal, family with empty intersection. So then I look at uh, the nerve of F is my complex, so this is my X, and I take the induced subcomplex on, uh, sorry, C, I take the induced subcomplex on F, and this is simply the nerve of F, which is a simplex, the boundary of a simplex on F vertices. Okay? Because, so you have how many vertices? Well, cardinality of F. And what, are, what is a nerve? Well, you get all subsets of non empty intersection except for the set itself. So you get all faces of all dimension, but you don't get the big set inside, in the middle. Okay? And now this has non trivial homology. dimension coordinate of f minus 1. Okay, so if you can find such a collection in C, you can find a certain y such that h of the size of the collection minus 1 is non zero. And that means you have to go further to get your Lorraine number. Okay? I know what Kalai and Meshulam did was, in a nutshell, the following. You, you start with a, a collection, a ground set G, which is a good cover. You pick your collection C, which has a property with that any F in C, so for any F you see, the intersection of F is a disjoint union of at most R elements of G. Okay, so you take a good cover, you take a collection where every in subfamily intersects in something which can be represented by at most R elements of G, disjoint. And now we look at two things. We look at the nerve of G, and we look at the nerve of C. And we project this simply by identifying for every element of G, which set is it a connected component of. Okay, so actually we... Uh, so it's not really this, we take H, the connected components of elements of C. So we look at the nerve of H, and for every, every element here is a connected component of some set in C. So this gives us a projection from H to C, and we can extend this projection from a projection from the nerve to the nerve. Okay. No, what they say is simply H is a subset of a good cover, so it is a good cover. By the nerve theorem, the nerve of H is the same as the union of its element. And this is true for any subset, any induced subcomplex. And so this means that the homology must vanish as of dimension d plus 1, because if you take an open subset of Rd, it has zero homology in dimension d plus 1 or greater. Okay, so the Lorentz number of the nerve of H, you can bound it by D using the nerve theorem. And then what they show that this assumption means that this projection is at most R to 1. You can map at most R elements here to one element there. 
Okay. So the assumption that every element in C is has at most R connected component, H in H, gives you that you have at most R vertices that map to the same set. Now if you look at one edge here, it means the intersection of two sets. This intersection has at most R connected component, which will be found as intersection of elements here, and so on. And so you can argue that for every element here, the projection maps at most R elements to that element. And this is enough to guarantee that the lower number of this Write it there. So theorem. If you get a projection pi from a simplicial complex X to a simplicial complex Y, where pi preserves the dimension, So it maps a vertex to a vertex, it maps an edge to an edge, a triangle, uh, triangle to a triangle, and so on. It doesn't remove the dimension or increase the dimension. And for any sigma in Y, the size of pi minus 1 of sigma is at most R, then the lower number of uh, y is at most r times the Lorray number of x plus 1, plus uh, r minus 1. OK, so it's, it's as usual. I mean, algebraic topology has developed tools to study the topology of a space, of the image of a space under some application. And this is the kind of properties that they use. So they prove this using spectral sequences on these kind of uh, tools. And now, this is good because they apply this to, for x, they take the nerve of h. For y, they take the nerve of c. You can, their assumption ensures that these two properties are satisfied. So they can bound the, so they can bound the Halley number of c by the Lorrain number of the nerve of C, which is again bounded by the Lorrain number of the nerve of H, which is bounded using uh, the nerve theorem by, uh, yeah, so that should be a plus <coughs> times, yeah, okay. like this. So using the nerve theorem, they bound this by D, and they get this. Okay? So 10 more minutes. I don't know who the chairman is. Five minutes, 10 minutes? Okay. <coughs> so in our setting, what fails? Well, so our assumption is the following. C is such that for any f in C, the intersection of f has at most r connected component each Contractible. Okay, so in particular, for example, C can be this. For R equal to. Now, if you want to apply the nerve theorem, well, what is the nerve of this? It's simply one, two, and a segment. And now the union, obviously, I mean, so these are the sets, right? The union is homotopic to a circle, and this is a segment. So obviously the nerve theorem is failing.
So the first thing we did was to extend this notion. And we define the multinerve of C. So the idea is instead of mm, assigning one simplex to every set, every collection with non empty intersection, we assign as many simplices as they are connected components. Okay, so we will simply take the family uh, C. Uh, where f is a subset of c and x is a component of So now this is no longer a simplicial complex. But it is still something nice. It is a simplicial poset. And just like you can think of branch manifold as manifolds that glue themselves along sub, sub mani uh, lower dimensional manifold, a simplicial poset is simply the same. It's, if you look, if you take a, a simplex, then the set of simplices you have inside must be homeomorphic to the f to the face lattice of a real simplex. So. This, for example, so this is a simplicial complex. This is not a simplicial complex, but is a simplicial poset. I am allowed to have several edges between two given vertices. What I am not allowed is to use two edges with the same set of vertices in a common triangle. Okay, so when you take a triangle, the, the projection on the set of vertices should give you an isomorphism, in other way. And so for simplicial posets, we can define similarly homology. We can define similarly Lorrain number. We can have uh, an analog of the nerve theorem. Which is uh, essentially a reformulation of a theorem known as uh, the uh, Lorez acyclic cover theorem. And so, what remains is to essentially ext extend this um, property of, of uh, projection. Okay, we, so we we then simply extend extend this and we show that if fix is a simplicial po simplicial poset and we project it on a simplicial complex such that these two operation hold then we can bound the lower number of y by something that is uh, not really the lower number of x, but something close. And, but something sufficiently close so that all nerve, analog of the nerve theorem still bounds out by d. Okay? And so the proof just carries through. And so I think I should perhaps stop here. Maybe if you have some questions. So,